Dear Diary, today I'm looking back at a trip I did in. It was my first long distance trip in the UK on my 125 motorbike donkey. Part 1. How I didn't do a land's end to join a great 125. An epic calamitous fail. Oh yes, and why Saddleback 73 calls me Calamity Quinn. By August I was quite fed up of trying to get a test mark for license and it was not happening all because of Covid. I was left feeling demoralised. I mean, I know things were in a difficult place for the whole planet. Millions of people had died and there was an international state of panic and emergency and the repercussions, well, I don't think we're ever going to be free of. And here was me, chucking my dummy out of pram because I couldn't get a big boy's bike. I actually did feel quite selfish. I felt bad that I was focusing on nobody me rather than on the actual bigger picture. But I had narrowly escaped an incident in January and I was damn lucky I was still able to walk and talk. And it made me think about a lot of things, things that I should be doing now and not waiting for. I concluded that it was time to put up or shut up. There was no more waiting. The only person I had to look at at the end of the day was me in the mirror. And I needed to give a better answer to myself when I asked those hard questions. So, my attempt to have that shake-up was the bike. I had had hobbies in the past from my photography, my hiking, my camping. Um, but slowly things had just been put away as everyone else came first. But not this time. Biking was my breakout. And it was also my realisation that if I didn't look after myself, I wasn't going to be around for much longer. Part 2. Why the Land's End to John O'Groats? On a small island like the UK, what's the longest distance? Well, apparently 850 miles odd, end to end. And what's called Lee Jog. Um, that's about it. So L-E, standing the Land's End. Jog being the Jan John O'Groats. Well, it's a challenge, and the distance isn't exactly that. It's always actually double that, because you have to get there and back from where you're from. So roughly, it's about um, 1,700 miles-ish. In 1882, I believe, it was Alfred Nixon who rode his uh, tricycle on the route, setting the challenge to all those who came after, and it actually remains one of the most iconic challenges today. In 1911... Ivan B. Hart Davis set the first motorcycle record and his three and a half horsepower triumph in 29 hours and 12 minutes. Nowadays we complain about having a 10 horsepower bike. <laughs> but it was actually the celebrities of the time, like the tennis superstar, um, it was A. Frederick Wilding, and he further popularised the route by undertaking the challenge on his motorbike, further cementing the route in the imagination of the public. Since then, this route's been walked, ridden, done by one wheel, two wheels, pedal and engine powered, and many more. In 1997, Hugh Edel Lin Yu uh, drove actually his JCB on the route in 22 hours, 10 minutes and 30 seconds. With modern evolutions and the electric age, this has not diminished the popularity of the route. On August 21st, 2017, John Chivers completed the first journey by electric motorcycle. It was actually a zero DSR. Perhaps it could be said that the Land's End to John O'Groats, um, or the jog, well, joggle if you're doing it the other way around, I suppose, um, to this date actually retains a certain allure, and it's not really waned in popularity, with so many regular events from classic car rallies, and also Nathan Millwood's garbage runs being increasingly popular. 
It's actually been a long-standing place in British culture as a rite of passage, as a means of testing your determination and grit. It actually remains as uh, strong as ever. All the purists still take the extra step of going to Lizard in the south uh, and Dunnett's Head in the north as a real extreme endpoint and not just the ends of the road. Part 3 Well, this is all very nice, Quinn, but let's get to the point. Well, what's this all got to do with me? Well, after waiting for over six months with tests not being put on at the time, lockdowns in place and not to end in sight, I decided I could either spend my time waiting for something to happen or I could get off my counter-suited backside and do something. So I decided to go on my 10 horsepower 125cc Taiwanese bike on my old plates. Well, if uh, Ed March and Nathan Millwood could do it around the world on a C90 in a posty bike, a 125 would be a doddle by comparison. I knew it had to be planned out. I'm not a last minute asher and I had spent weeks comparing and contrasting the routes where I could go and where I could stay. Part of this was understanding who I was today. 20 years earlier I'd probably laugh in the face of a 500 mile day but now in my mid 40s I needed a lot more rest stops but I just did not have the extra time. They were all going to be long, long days. So the route I divided into two, two legs, south leg and a north leg. The south leg would be about 800 miles ish. Um, so day one would be, be from Derbyshire to Launceston, which is approximately 280 miles. Um, and on day two, it would be Launceston to Land's End, then back to Launceston, another 165 miles odd. And day three would be then be again Launceston back to Derbyshire, another 280 miles odd. So day four would be Derbyshire to Edinburgh, about 300 miles. And then Edinburgh to John O'Groats, uh, approximately another 300 miles. Then uh, John O'Groats to Glasgow, uh, another 300 odd miles. And then Glasgow back to Derbyshire, another 300 odd miles. Now looking back, I had actually never covered more than 80 miles in a single day on the 125 before I set off on this journey. I'd just like to point out the dangers of doing things, comparing them to what you imagine you will be able to cope with versus knowing what you can actually do today. Part 4. Pre-launch pad and launch pad's first McCrash. The weeks prior to leaving my plans had just gone to pot and lockdown and other things had just got in the way of me getting seat time and budget getting all of the things that I actually wanted. For luggage I settled on a £60 Joe Farmer, a U-shaped bag for the rear seat of my bike and I had decided I was going to risk it all with the waterproofing. After all, how bad could it be? For reasons unknown to me, the day before I was to leave, I decided it'd be a good idea to put all my things in the living room so I could get ready for the next day, as I'd planned to leave at 5am in hopes of beating the traffic and making good progress. 15 minutes later and making a cuppa. And then I froze as I heard a crash coming down the stairs. I ran in a panic state as I feared the baby had opened the gate at the top of the stairs and fallen down. I imagined the worst. For a second relief washed over me as I saw the gate closed with my bundle of joy upstairs safe and sound. I looked down at the ground and I saw my helmet broken at my feet. Waves of disbelief and panic and several colour metaphors streamed out of me. I saw it straight away. One of the side latches was broken and it wouldn't shut. It was knackered and I did not have time to muck about. I was totally gutted. I'd really like the helmet too. I saw my watch. Ooh. I might have time to get another one if I left now. So I phoned BDLA in Nottingham and they had one in stock in my size. I dropped everything and I did a runner. It was 45 minutes till they closed and I had a 45 minute journey there. I arrived just as they were about to close. I tried it on, it fit. I suppose I didn't really have a choice um, at all. Well, not if, not if I was planning on going. But this was not a feeling like a fun, restful trip like I had envisaged. All of my planning had fallen to bits. Part five. The night before 
um, I went to sleep at 1 a.m. I was hoping to leave uh, before 4 but I woke up at 4 and I left just after 5. It's not too bad considering what could have happened but as I was actually doing my last minute checks to make sure I had everything it suddenly hit me. I had never actually ridden with all of my gear on the bike. If that wasn't bad enough I probably actually not left the uh, Midlands to travel anywhere new in the UK in well over 20 years. This realisation gripped me just before I was about to step out the front door and close it behind me. As I paused I looked down at my feet and I remembered a quote from The Hobbit. It's a dangerous business Frodo, going out your front door. You step onto the road and if you don't keep your feet there's no knowing where you might be swept off to. With a huge grin, I closed the door, hobbled over to my overloaded 125 and stalled it. Part 6. The first stop. I don't remember much of the A38 between Derby and Birmingham. This was my regular route and I was an autopilot. I'd travelled this way thousands of times throughout my life and each curve and dip was familiar and it helped me to ease me into the rhythm of the route and the new feel of the bike. I did have to stop after I got to Burton to tighten the straps as two of them had actually fallen off and so I had to use two of my only spares to replace them. The air was fresh and I focused my full concentration blocking out any thoughts and letting my White Snake remix tape loop as I death gripped the handles <laughs> and struggled to keep up the traffic. On the other side of Birmingham, I pulled into a lay-by. My feet were freezing, my hands were killing and I was miserable. With the lorry spraying me with rainwater like it was going out of fashion or trying to run me over. Well, usually in that order. But it also marked for me the furthest I had been, the limits of my world. And like Frodo, I was compelled to stop and take note. I took a few minutes to warm up again, jogging up the side of the road and doing star jumps in my helmet and biking gear. I did get a few looks and I made a small video. I had a long way to go and the weather was not looking good. I got back on and White Snake summed up my mood. Here I go again. Part 7 Petrol stop and get questioned by security. About 45 minutes out of Birmingham, there were various roadworks going on and after dodging another white van in a merge, I decided it was time for a break. I pulled into a petrol station, I got a much needed coffee and took some pictures for my Instagram. And at this point, security and petrol station staff appeared as I was sitting in the ground next to Donkey. <coughs> Excuse me sir, our staff are quite concerned you've been taking pictures of the petrol station and I've been sitting here quite a while. Anything we can help you with? I looked around and saw some nervous people looking at me and then I looked at myself. Well, I didn't look like a tramp with an overloaded bike with a tired face only a mother could love. Ah, well, you see. So I proceeded to them to tell them my story and at the end I'd gained two new subscribers Encourage a store manager to go live his dream after finding him a course in Open University. Encourage another one to join St. John's Ambulance so he could learn more skills. The cherry on the top was a free refill and the best wishes from the staff. So as I waved goodbye after stopping for well over 90 minutes, now I was seriously behind. But I was ready to get back on the road with a new confidence and a spring in my step. And the bonus that I had, I had not been arrested. Yes, score one me. Part 8 As the song kinda goes, no one can see you when you're riding in the rain. After leaving the Warwick area, the rain kinda started. It was torrential, non-stop, oh, and for some reason every t it would only stop when I pulled over for a rest. I still haven't decided if that was a good thing or a bad thing, but I got into a rhythm. I would ride till I was tired, stop, warm up with a few star jumps, and then try to cycle through my gloves to see which one was less wet and after a, hot, after a little hot cuppa if possible or a snack followed by some photos and checking my phone I was back on the road again. 
but this was pretty much my whole day but the weather did improve once I got, got past Exeter and the sunset was stunning as I got into Cornwall. I had to stop and watch it in a lay-by. It was a strange feeling to go back and think of all my first that day. I'd finally seen Stonehenge, a big one for me, and I felt so confident in myself. And I think part of me had not expected me to make it down the road. Um, I had been waiting to do a trip like this for so long, but it felt surreal at times. Being alone for such a long time and not having a timetable or having a stack of jobs or being consistently on the go from a task was bizarre. I felt like I was missing something. I should have been doing something or should have been somewhere. Yet at the same time it's exhilarating. Being free from the norm, being somewhere new, not having to think about you know, or worry about all the thousand of things we do on a daily basis in our lives, I suppose. The silence was something that we all search for in the noise of our life. Sometimes it can be found in the most crowded of places. And times like these, it was found by shedding my daily responsibilities, having distance from all I knew. After almost 16 hours and well over 350 miles later, I finally arrived, having suffered several detours, taking several wrong turns and taking too many rest stops and sampling the high quality discount sticker cuisine offered by G petrol stations along the way. What? What um, I arrived at Dorset Farm in Boyton, just up the road from Launceston. It was exactly what I needed. I was exhausted, wet, dirty and starving. Farmer John, as he will ever remain to me, and his lovely wife greeted me with a smile and didn't say a word about me arriving too late uh, and reassured me that the bike would be okay. It was the end of my first day and I was looking forward to finally seeing Land's End tomorrow. But what I didn't know, this had probably been the easiest day of the trip so far. It was about to go downhill from here. End of day one.